Yeah, just yeah. take it away. There we go. Okay. Okay, so of course, thank you uh, all of you for attending and especially thank you to, to Alvaro for his invitation. So uh, the official title is homological invariance for nodes and links. So I work in a theory, and when he invited me to to give this this talk in the seminar, uh, I was not sure about what topic I should choose. So uh, because I know many of you are, I mean, most of you are not working in in a theory. So I decided that instead of speaking about some of I don't know, some of the last projects about a specific property of a family of links or something very technical, I decided that I prefer to give a, an overview on no theory and of two of the, the two main homological invariants that, that we have in no theory. So, uh, well, let me, okay, yes. So this is going to be more or less the, the structure of the talk. Um, these are, well, five sections, and the first one will be some introduction. I will assume that uh, you know nothing about nodes and links, so I will start from the very beginning, defining what is a node, what is a link, what do we study, and so on. Okay, so I put a lot of pictures, and everything is very combinatorial, so, so I hope you don't get bored and you follow <laughs> the talk to the very end. And um, well, the goal is to speak about these two homological invariants, covanoff homology and not floer homology. So uh, the talk is like, I thought of it as in two blocks. In the first one, I will explain what is Jung's polynomial, whose categorification is covanoff homology, and then we will explain covanoff homology and say a few words about its geometrization, which is covanoff homotopy type. And then uh, in the second part, I will explain Alexander polynomial, and well, there are many definitions of Alexander polynomial uh, from the geometric point of view, from the algebraic point of view, combinatorial point of view. So I choose just the geometric one because it's the one I like most. And I will also uh, give the grid definition, which we will see. And then uh, we will see uh, not floor homology, which is a categorification of Alexander polynomial. So this is more or less the structure of the talk. The first part, I will try to cover sections one, two, and three, and then in the second part, four and five. But maybe this is too ambitious, so if I have to cut at some point, I will cut. <laughs> okay, so let's start. So what is a knot? Okay, here we have many nodes, but for a mathematician, these are not nodes, okay? For us, a node is a subset of points homeomorphic to a circle, okay? So these are three examples of nodes. The first one is the one that uh, is named the, we call it the ANC node or the trivial node, because as you see, the, well, if you think of a rope that you tie and you glue both endpoints together, so in the first case, you see that you haven't really knotted the, the rope. Uh, this is trivial. Okay, so this is a trivial knot. And uh, if we have a finite disjoint union of knots, what we have is a link. Okay, so we have here three examples of links. Uh, and this n here, this number of knots, is called the number of components of the link. So in the first case, we have a link of three components, three trivial components, in fact, the red one, the green one, and the blue one. In the second example, we have a link of two components. And in the third one, we have a link of five components, okay? So this one is, is called, uh, this link is called uh, the Borromean rings. And it has a, a property that uh, the three rings are uh, nested. I mean, not nested, they are, um, you cannot pull one apart from the others, okay? But if you, pull one of them apart, then you can separate the other two, okay? Uh, maybe in this picture, you can see this property uh, more easily. So if imagine that you pull apart the yellow one, that you remove this component, okay? Then the pink and the green one can be separated, okay? But in principle, if you have the three of them, you cannot do that. So this is the, the symbol of the International Mathematical Union. This is the, the logo. So these are Borromean rings. 
And well, the name comes because uh, it appears in the coat of arms of the Borromeo family, which was an, an Italian uh, family. Here you see the three rings together, okay? Okay, so we know what, is, what are knots, what are links, and what are we interested in? Uh, what do we study in knot theory? So what we want to know is, okay, if we have two knots, does exist an ambient isotopy connecting, uh, move, I mean, starting in one of them and connecting it to the other? So in, well, this is the, the main problem that we want to solve in knot theory. So we want, if we are given two knots, we want to know if they are ambient isotopic or not, okay? So if the answer is yes, then we say that both knots are equivalent and for us, they will be exactly the same. We won't distinguish between them. So if two knots are equivalent, meaning that you can go from one to the other with an ambient isotopy, then uh, we don't distinguish them and they, they are equivalent for us. They are the same knot. So uh, knots are in, in three, are three dimensional objects, but we want to work in two dimensions sometimes, so we consider diagrams, okay? And diagrams are just projection of the knot. You have a knot, you uh, take a projection, and the only thing that we need to add is uh, in the points where we have um, double points, I mean, for example, here we have a double point, we need to include the information on which part of the strand was closer to the point where we are projecting from, okay? So in this case, uh, since this part of the strand is closer to my eyes and I'm projecting from my eyes, then the, the part of the strand that goes under this one, I just remove a little bit of this of this strand, okay? So this is what we call a crossing. So in this diagram, we have three crossings, okay? And this is a diagram of a knot. Of course, uh, a knot have many, many diagrams, many meaning infinite diagrams, okay? So uh, if we have, for example, this knot, we can associate it this diagram. And now if we start moving, playing a little bit with the strand, we get this knot, which was equivalent to the first one. And now we consider a diagram of this knot. If we project, we get this D prime, okay? So we say that two diagrams are equivalent if and only if they represent equivalent knots. This is just definition, okay? Two diagrams are equivalent if and only if the knots that they represent are equivalent, meaning that they are ambient isotopic. And so um, we also have this theorem by Redemeister telling us when two diagrams are equivalent. And this theorem says that two diagrams are equivalent if and only if you can go from one to the other one by a finite sequence of Redemeister moves. Um, these are Rademeister moves. We have three moves, Rademeister 1, Rademeister 2, Rademeister 3. And here you have the, the sketch of them. So this means, this uh, little uh, circle means that, for example, Rademeister 1 going from here to here means that two diagrams are exactly the same, but in a little neighborhood where one strand in one of them is like here and in the other diagram the strand is like here so uh this is what re these pictures mean Redemeister one you can think of it if you think in three dimensions is just like taking a strand and doing a loop Redemeister two could be just uh, you can think of it as if you have two strands and you pass one in front of the other and Redemeister three is just you have one crossing and one strand over the rest, and then you just take this part of the strand and pull it down like here, okay? But this is in two dimensions. These moves are in two, di are in, yes, in diagrams, in two dimensions, okay? So for example, if we want to see if these two diagrams are equivalent, we need to go from one to the other by a finite sequence of those moves. 
So for example, in this case, we take these two parts of the strands and we see that uh, we can pull one, we can use Minimister 2 to go from here to here. Now we can uh, do our Minimister 3 moves by taking this blue strand and pulling it to the right, like here, okay? And now, yes, we do a ready mister one in this blue part of the strand. So finally, we reach the diagram D2. So what we have is that diagram one and diagram two are equivalent because we were able to connect them by a, by a finite sequence of ready mister moves. So we can think, OK, so maybe we have solved the problem because if we have two nodes and we want to know if they are equivalent, we can consider a diagram for each of them. And then we use Rademeister theorem to determine if the diagrams are equivalent. And if the diagrams are equivalent, then the nodes are equivalent. And if diagrams are not equivalent, then uh, nodes are not equivalent. So, okay, if we find a sequence of Rademeister moves taking one diagram to the other, then okay, diagrams are equivalent, so nodes are equivalent. But if we don't find such a sequence, what is going on? We, we cannot be sure that uh, this sequence doesn't exist. So how long should we keep looking for such a sequence, right? Uh, so this is the, the problem that we find. And it's in, in this context where uh, nodes invariants uh, appear, OK? So well, this is very introductory. I know maybe you are, <laughs> you know this, but this is just introduction so uh well we have nodes invariants and uh, what is a not invariant so it's just a function from the set of nodes to any other set we can have polynomials groups natural numbers uh some property that either you have it or not uh, topological space whatever okay you have here other set and uh, uh, since it is an invariant, the important thing is that the value of this function depends on the equivalence class of the node. Meaning that if the nodes are equivalent, then the value is the same, okay? So if we have two nodes and we want to see if they are uh, equivalent, we just compute the invariant for each of them. And if the value of the invariant is different in each of them, then the nodes are not equivalent but if the value is the same, well, we don't know. We, we cannot say, yes, uh, the nodes are equivalent. We are not sure. If the value are the same, is the same, then uh, we need to go to and look for a stronger invariant. And this is how, this is the reason why nodes invariants are important and we, we are interested in, in having new nodes invariants. So just to show you some examples of invariants, the easiest one, one can think, is well if we speak about links instead of speaking about nodes then the number of components is the easier invariant why because you just associate to each link its number of components uh, in k1 for example we have just one rope one closed rope let's say one knot so uh, the f of k1 equals one in K2, you see that we have two nodes. So here we have two. Here we have the brown, the orange, and the gray nodes. So we have three. And here, again, two. So it is trivial that this is a not invariant, because uh, if you have two components here and one component here, uh, you cannot find an ambient isotopy taking K2 to K1. So it's, it's trivial that this is a, a not invariant. So by using this one, this uh, number of components invariant, we know that the only links that could be equivalent are K2 and K4. But I'm not saying that they are equivalent. I'm saying just that these are the only one which could be equivalent, OK? But not K1 and not K3, because the number of components is different. So other interesting not invariant is the, the crossing number. And this is defined in the, in the following way. We have a node, and recall that a node can be represented by an infinite number of diagrams, OK? So for each diagram, we define CD as the number of crossings of the diagram. So the crossing number of a node, or of a link is the same, uh, the crossing number of a node 
is defined as the minimal number of crossings taken among all the diagrams representing the knot. Okay. This is, of course, a, a not invariant, a link invariant, because it's the minimal, so it's, of course, an invariant. And, uh, well, let's see this example. We have, for example, the trefoil. And we have seen before that this diagram represents the, the trefoil. This knot is called trefoil, OK? So this diagram represents the trefoil. It has three crossings. And we also saw uh, before that this diagram is equivalent to this one. But this one has five crossings. So since three is smaller than five, we know that the crossing number of the trefoil is at most three. OK? But we have this conjecture by tight of the uh, 90s. Well, now it's theorem. It was proved by Kaufman, Murasugi, and Tisterweight independently. But uh, we, I mean, it's, it's people know it as tight conjecture. OK? And this result tells us that if we have a diagram which is reduced, I am not going to speak about this, but which is reduced and alternating, then the crossing number of the knot is given by the crossing number of this diagram. You cannot find a diagram with a smaller number of crossings. So realizing the knot. So what is alternating? Alternating is just that when you follow the diagram, you go, each time you have a crossing, you go over, under over, under, over, under, as here, OK? Here, not. Here, you see that you have over, over, under, under. So this is not alternating, but the first one is alternating. So this uh, theorem tell us that the crossing number of trefoil is 3, because this is alternating and it's reduced. So you cannot uh, get a diagram representing the trefoil with less than 3 crossings, OK? So, well, this was uh, crossing number. And then can I will I, go. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. The, the, the conjecture was after the theorem. Is that what you're saying? Oh, sorry. This is 1890s. Ah, okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yes. So, okay, yes. Okay. No, no. It was in the 90s, but in the, I mean, the previous century. <laughs> yeah. It, this state is in 1890s. Sorry. Yes, this is a mistake. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it will be funny to have a conjecture after the yeah after the proof of the theorem. <laughs> so um, other uh, link invariant. Uh, I'm going to explain this one because uh, we will use this in the second part of the of the talk for Alexander polynomial. So the link number is another link invariant, and it is an invariant of oriented links. And what are oriented links is just when you have either a link or a knot, uh, for each component, we can choose one of the two different orientations. OK, either, I mean, you have the strand and you either move on one direction or the opposite one. So this is an oriented link. For example, here I have a link, a diagram of a link of two components. So I have chosen an orientation for each of the components, OK, with this arrow. So. In order to define this diagram, we need to know what are positive and negative crossings. And this is this picture is the definition of what is a positive and a negative crossing. Imagine you are moving in the direction of the of the orientation. So if while you moving you are moving on the over strand, you look down, and the direction goes to the left, then it's positive. And if you are moving on the over strand. In the, in the direction that the arrow say, and look down, and uh, the direction is to the right, then this is negative, OK? So in this case, if we go in the over is the green, and we look down, this goes to the left, so this is positive. And the same here, if we move to the through the purple, and we look down, this one goes to the left, so this is positive. So here we have two positive crossings. And we are going to associate to each crossing a number, either a one or a minus one. So a one if it is positive, and a minus one if the crossing is negative. So in this case, uh, we have one and one. And we define, if we have a not diagram, we define the linking number. This is defined in diagrams for the moment, OK? As one half of the sum taken 
over those numbers associated to the crossings, but just the crossings where you have components of, sorry, you have a, a strand of different components, okay? So in this case, you have one plus one quotient two, so you have that the linking number of this diagram is one. But I told you that this is a link invariant, and in fact, it is very easy to check that this is a link invariant because in order this to be a link invariant, it has to be invariant under Rademeister 1, Rademeister 2, and Rademeister 3 moves. So Rademeister 1 and Rademeister 3 moves are trivial because since, I mean, here you just change the position. In the third one, you just change the position of the strand, but not the signs of the crossings. So this sum is the same. And in the first one, this Crossing is not contributing to this sum because remember that here we are just taking into account the crossings involving different components. And this is the same component, okay? So Radiomaster 1 and Radiomaster 3 invariance is trivial. And for Radiomaster 2, we just need to check that here we have no crossings, but if you perform this move, no matter the orientation, one crossing is going to be positive and the other one is going to be negative, okay? So this is a link invariant. So in fact, we can put here an L. It depends on the link, not on the invariant. And it is trivial to check that if we have a link, uh, which is the disjoint union of two components, may, meaning that you can pull one away the other, you can pull them apart, then the linking number is zero. They are not linked. The linking number is zero. And the opposite is not true. For example, this is the white head link. These two are negative, these two are positive, so the linking number of the whitehead link is zero. Notice that this one is not playing because this is purple component, okay? So, yeah. So this is linking number. And now uh, we are going to move so to more interesting uh, invariants, uh, polynomial invariants. We have, these are the four main polynomial invariants. Alexander polynomial was the first one. It was discovered in 1928 and rediscovered by Conway in 1969. And sometimes it is known as Alexander Conway polynomial because of that rediscovery of Conway. And well, we also have Jones polynomial, which was discovered by, by Vauban Jones. And this, uh, this was, well, he won the Fields Medal because of the because of this discovery of this Jones polynomial. And this was the first polynomial invariant distinguishing a knot from its mirror image. The mirror image is just, uh, you imagine the knot uh, reflected in a mirror, meaning that the crosses which are like that, they are now like that, okay? So yeah, so this was the first polynomial invariant distinguishing, for example, the right-handed trefoil from the left-handed uh, trefoil, which are these ones. And then, uh, well, uh, we can also associate to, to a, a knot, uh, an homology uh, group. So uh, we have, these are the three homological invariants, which are more uh, well known. Kovanov homology, knot flower homology, and kovanov rothansky homology. And uh, Kovanov homology categorifies Jones polynomial, and it detects trivial knot, which is this is a very, very famous open question if Jones polynomial detects the unknot. Uh, but for Kovanov homology, it is known that yes, that Kovanov homology is an unknot detector. Okay. So, uh, well, this is Mikhail Kovanov, a professor at Columbia University. And well, not flower homology categorifies Alexander Conway polynomial and it detects a trivial knot via genus. Uh, we will see this, but yes, uh, not flower homology detects genus, and since trivial knot is the only one having genus zero, then it detects trivial knot. Could I ask a question? Yes. So when you say detects uh, the trivial knot, you mean that? That like... if, if uh, for example, uh, in Kovanov homology, you compute the Kovanov homology of the trivial knot, and is uh, in two copies of Z in gradings this and this, okay? So if you have a knot, you compute its command of homology and its command of homology is the same as the one of the trivial knot, then this knot is the trivial knot. Okay, okay, thank you. And for Jones polynomial, 
Uh, John's polynomial of, tri of trivial knot is one. So it is an open question whether there exists any other knot having uh, John's polynomial equals one. So this is not known and it's very, and very important and very famous, <laughs> very popular question in open question in the theory. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's go to, to John's polynomial um, and common homology. So, okay, in this section, I will, I will start with the main properties and then I will tell you in a very combinatorial way how you can compute John's polynomial. Okay, we will do even an example. So, John's polynomial is a, a Laurent polynomial, okay, with integer coefficients, q, q minus one RT variables. It is an invariant of oriented links. Recall that oriented link was just the link with the orientation, okay? And recall that here we have this notion of positive and negative crossings that we explained before. Recall it was something like that. And it can be computed via Kaufman bracket. Um, this gives us some scheme relation for Jones polynomial, but we are not going to, to use it. We are going to explain it in another way. So the first thing we need to, uh, to define Jones polynomial, and this will be useful also for Kovan homology, are Kaufman states. A state of a diagram is just uh, an assignation to each crossing we associate either a zero or a one. This is a Kaufman state of a diagram, okay? So for example, if we have the trefoil diagram, this will be an state. And a state is just saying, okay, to the first crossing, well, you choose an order for the crossing, and then you say, for the first one, I will associate a one, to the second one a zero, and to the third one a one, for example, okay? This is an state. Of course, since you have two options, two possibilities for each crossing, at the end you have two up to the uh, to see uh, different states for a diagram, okay? Where C is the number of crossings, yeah? And just for notation, instead of saying this is crossing one, this is two, this is three, I'm putting this, this defining this map, I will just use, write the, I will just use this notation. When I say one, zero, one, I mean, to the first one, I associate a one, to the second one, a zero, and to the third one, a one. And this is the way I'm going to codify an state, okay? So now we have to smooth each crossing. Smooth the crossing is just to remove the crossing by following some rules. And this is the rule we are going to follow. If we have a zero label in a crossing, then when we are approaching, through the over strand and we reach the crossing, we turn to the left. Like here, you see, we are here, this goes to the left, or this doesn't depend on orientation. If you think you come that way, if you are walking here, 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 and you reach the crossing, then you turn to the left. So it's the same, this doesn't depend on orientation, okay? And if you are moving through the uh, over crossing, to, through the over the strand and you reach the crossing and you turn to the right, that is what you do when you have a one label, okay? So if you do this for all the, the crossings here, uh, we get something like that. You see that here, this Z3 has a one. So when we were approaching, we turn to the right and here the same to the right. So we get this and well, you see, right? That from here you get this just because you chose one, zero, one. So you, we get this picture. At the end, you always get a set of disjoint circles in the, in the plane, okay? With these little segments telling us the place where there was a crossing. And using the red one to, mm, I mean, just to say one and the blue one means zero. Just not to have to put all the time zero or one. I just use colors. Red is one, blue is zero, okay? So if, for example, I have chosen zero, 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 then the smoothings of Z3 and Z1 will be different and I get this picture here, okay? So this is one state, this is other state, and yeah, these are the, the smoothed diagrams corresponding to these states, okay? So uh, 
now uh, to each state we have a diagram we choose an state and now to each state we are going to associate a polynomial and of course you don't have to learn this for the i mean this is just so you get the idea that we associate a polynomial and this polynomial is defined that way where k means the number of circles we have and r is the number of ones we have in the state so for example in our previous case we had this so we associate to this state to the state s we associate minus one to the we have two ones so to the second power q to the second power and now q plus q minus one to the and we count the number of circles we have two circles so to the second power okay and the Kaufman bracket is defined just by taking the sum over all possible states associated to the diagram. So we have diagrams, consider in this case two to the third power, the eight states that we have, then to each of them we associate a polynomial and you take the sum of all of them. And this is invariant under Ray de Meister 2 and Ray de Meister 3 moves. It is not difficult to, to check that this is invariant under R2 and R3. But we want a link invariant. We want something to be also invariant under the really master one move. And here is where uh, orientation plays a role. If we write P for the number of positive crossings and N for the number of negative crossings, then we have to normalize by this factor. Okay. And this preserves the invariance under the master two and three. And is also invariant under the really master one. So this is Jones polynomial. And this is a link invariant. Okay, this was not the original way, uh, the original definition of Jones, but this was given later by by Kaufman. So this is Jones polynomial definition via Kaufman bracket. So yes, let's see the example. We have our trefoil. We wanted to consider the eight states, eight possible states. You can notice here that I organized this in such a way that in the first column, there are no ones. In the second columns, I have the states with one, one and two zeros. In the third column, I have two ones and one zero. And in the third column, the three uh, crossings has a one label. Okay. And you can see, this is not important for Jones polynomial, but it's important for Coban homology. You see that here I have a cube. I have constructed a kind of cube. And each edge of the cube connects two states differing in one coordinate, going from zero to one. You see, zero, zero, zero goes to zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, and then these two are connected in zero, one, one. You see how the this is the cube. Okay, I did the same for the the eight possible states, and I have the cube. So well, just to compute Jones, this is going to be important for Kovanov homology, not for Jones polynomial, but for Kovanov homology, this idea of the cube. So if we want to compute uh, Jones polynomial of the trefoil, we just associate to each, uh, to each state the, the polynomial, as we said before. Here we have zero ones and two circles. So we have these. In all these three cases, I have a one. So I have minus one to the one power q to the one to the first power and i have one circle so q plus q minus one to the first power so i have this in this case i have two ones and two circles so i have these and in these cases i have three ones and three circles so i have these and now yes if i want to compute the uh, kaufman bracket of the trefoil link of the trefoil node sorry i just add all these polynomials i get this so if you my computations you get that and now we just need to normalize with this factor since the three crossings here are positive n is zero so at the end we get q plus q to the third power plus q to the fifth power minus q to the ninth power so this is jones polynomial of the trefoil knot and this is a link invariant okay so this is the way how we compute um, um jones polynomial of a knot and that's it so now we will move to Kovanov homology, which is a categorification of Jones polynomial. And can again, I, as yeah. Can I ask a small question? So in the, yes, yes. Is it a coincidence that the 
number of circles seems to be equal to the number of ones in this example? Yes, yes, yes. It's a completely coincidence. In fact, in the same column, uh, you can have, for example, in with one one, you can have uh, one circle, and then if you have one one but in other position, meaning in other crossing, then you might have uh, two circles. And um, yes, in this, it's a coincidence in this case. But I chose this uh, example because it's the easiest non-trivial example, and drawing sure. this is horrible for other, for other right. links. But yes, it's just coincidence, yeah. Thanks. So uh, if there are no more, yeah, that works. OK. So we move to Kovana homology. Kovanov homology uh, was uh, discovered by Mikhail Kovanov around 2000, and it is a big graded homology, meaning that it has uh, the groups have two, two indexes, two homology, uh, the quantum degree and the homological degree. Okay, it is of course a link invariant, and it categorifies Jones polynomial in the sense that the Euler characteristics of the of the Kovanov homology coincides with the Jones polynomial of the link. Okay, we will see this later. But yeah, this it categorifies Jones polynomial in this sense. From Kovanov homology, we can recover Jones polynomial. And in fact, it's a stronger invariant because, for example, these two knobs have the same uh, Jones polynomial. But if we go to the Kovanov homology tables, these are the gradients, okay, the blue gradients, the green gradients, and these are their uh, Kovanov homology tables that, as you can see here, they are different. Okay, but the Jones polynomial are the same. So it's a stronger invariant. It detects the unknot, as we said before. It detects also the two components trivial link, meaning uh, two trivial knots uh, pull apart that are not uh, really linked. So Kovanov homology detects the two components trivial link. And from Kovanov homology, you can compute the S invariant, which was discovered by Rasmussen in 2003. And this as invariant provides a lower bound for the sliced genus of a knot and gives a combinatorial proof of the topological Milner conjecture on, uh, on the sliced genus of torus, torus links, torus knots, sorry. So yeah, these are just properties of Kovana homology. So now let's see how to, to define it. So to define common homology, uh, we need to define the, the chain complex. We need to define the chain groups, which are going to be uh, free abelian groups. OK, these groups are going to be free abelian groups. And uh, we need to define some differentials, OK, connecting, yeah, I mean, the chain complex. And once we have done that, we can take the quotient and we get, well, we will say cohomology groups because the gradings are going up, but no one says Kovan of cohomology. Everybody says Kovan of homology. So we are going to call them homology groups, okay? Because in the case of uh, Kovan of homology, the gradings go up, but it is called Kovan of homology, okay? So uh, we will define now the Kovanov complex. We are going to define the chain groups and the differentials. So we go back to our cube, the cube we had before for the trefoil. And we are going to define V is going to be a graduate vector space generated by two generators. Let's call them V minus and V plus. And this graduate means that each element in this vector space has one grading. And for the generators, V minus, its grading is going to be minus one, and the degree of V plus is going to be one. Okay, so we have two generators, one with degree minus one, other one with degree plus one. And now to each circle, we are going to associate a copy of this vector space, a copy of a V. So in this case, we have V times V, V tensor product V. Here we have V, V, V. Here V tensor product V. I mean, you see, okay? For each circle, I use colors just to represent that for each circle, we have one associated vector space. And these are the chain groups, okay? You just, you have columns, so just take the, the sum. Here we have V, 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 so we have this here. I mean, you, you see from the picture, okay? So these are the chain groups. 
And now we need to define the differentials. Okay, so the differentials, of course, are going to be related with those edges in the cube. And recall that in each edge connects two states differing just in one coordinate going from zero to one. Okay, so notice that when we go from a zero marker to a one marker, we are changing the way we are smooth. So if we go from here to here, we can have two situations. Either the strands are connected that way, this one with this one, and this one with this one, so we are merging two circles into one, or the strands are connected the other way. This one is connected to this one, and this one is connected to this one. So we are splitting one circle into two. Okay, so we have, each time we go from zero to one, we are doing one of those two things. We either merge two circles into one or split one circle into two. So in the first case, we are going to define a multiplication. Here we have a copy of V, a copy of V, and here one V. So we are going to define this multiplication. V plus times V plus goes to V plus. B plus times B minus is going to go to B minus. B minus times B plus is going to be to is going to go to B minus, and B minus times B minus go to zero. This is the important thing. B minus times B minus goes to zero. Okay. And in this case, in the case where we split one circle into two, we need to go from V to V times V because here we have two circles. So here we define a commultiplication and is given in that way, okay? And D is defined on each edge by either a multiplication if we are doing a merging or a commultiplication if we are doing splitting. And well, we need to add some signs so that this is really a differential, but we are not going to go through that, okay? In the signs, we just take into account the number of ones of the states, but we are not going to, to go through that. So if we go back to our example, here you see that you have two circles and here we have one. So this is a multiplication. Here we have two circles and we have one. So this is a multiplication. And yeah, this is the way it works. But for example, here, this circle, we are not performing anything on it, okay? It is, I mean, the circle is preserved here and we are just splitting the circle. So in this circle, in this copy of V, uh, is the identity, the map that we associate to this, that is acting on this first copy of V. We have the identity taking this copy of V, the one corresponding to this circle, to the one corresponding to that circle. And in this circle, we apply the commultiplication and get this, two, the two copies of V is corresponding to this circle and this circle, okay? And if you have other circles here and you are not touching them, then you get the identity for all the circles that are not playing this game of merging or splitting, okay? In each edge, you have either a merging or, uh, or a splitting. So, so yeah, this is how we define the differential. So uh, some question or can I, yeah, okay. So this is how we define Kovanov complex. And well, uh, we have some gradients. I told you this was a big gradient homology. So each element in the vector space has really two gradients. And I degree depending just on the number of ones and a J degree depending on the orientation, meaning the positive and negative crossings on the number of ones and on this internal grading of the generators but well this is just so you know where the gradients are coming from but the important thing is that we can take the quotient and what Kovanov proved was that these groups are link invariants and this is what uh, well the Kovanov complex the complex depends on the diagram but when you take the quotient the diagram is not important anymore just this is a link invariant so we forget about the d and we can write here an l and that's it okay these are Kovanov homology groups. So for our example of the trefoil knot, we get this table, meaning that this is the homological grading, the I and the J is the quantum grading. 
So uh, in homological grading three and quantum grading nine, meaning group H39, we get Z. Uh, for example, we get Z2, we have torsion in the H37 group, okay? And this is how, how we encode uh, quantum homology with those tables, okay? So if we want to recover uh, Jones polynomial of the trefoil link that we computed before, it was this one, recall we computed this in the, in the previous section. So if we want to recover this, we just use this table and say, okay, this group is, let's start with this one. We have minus one to zero, zero is even. So uh, we have minus one to zero, Q one, meaning Q, this is giving us this Q. Then the next one, this is zero. Uh, sorry, this is uh, I index zero. So we have minus one to the zero power Q three. So this is plus Q three. For example, here, this pink uh, group, this Z, we have minus one to the third power, meaning a minus, a negative sign, and now Q to the nine, uh, to ninth power. So we have this. And this is how you recover uh, Jones polynomial from the Kovanov homology, uh, from Kovanov homology, yes, from the table. A torsion group doesn't, con don't contribute to the polynomial, just, uh, yeah. So that is how you uh, compute. Uh, this is the way how uh, Kovanov homology categorifies Jones polynomial. And well, uh, now you can think, okay, Kovanov homology conceptually is very simple, but when we start doing computation, it becomes impractical, okay? It is exponential. You have, for just thinking on the states, you have two up to the number of crossings states, and then you have to consider the, the copies of the graded vector space. You have to, I mean, it's in, completely impractical. So we look for new approaches to Kovanov homology. And we look for uh, geometrizations of Kovanov homology. And um, well, why do we do this? Okay, this is one reason because we want something uh, that could make computations easier. But this geometrization, we want uh, that we hope that they uh, give us a better understanding of the structure of Kovanov homology, and we can get new invariants which are stronger than Kovanov homology. That may distinguish knots uh, that are not distinguished by Kovanov homology. So yeah, I don't know, can I? Yes, I will continue a little bit. <laughs> so yeah, so now I will speak a bit about this Kovanov homotopy type. Uh, Lipschitz and Sarkar uh, has a refined Kovanov homology uh, with this Kovanov homotopy type. Uh, this is their paper that they published in 2011. And in few words, what they do is they have a diagram and they associate to each diagram, they construct a Kovanov spectrum. This is a, a space, okay? And the homotopy type of this Kovanov spectrum is a link invariant. But even more, the cohomology of this Kovanov spectrum coincides with Kovanov homology of the, of the link, of the diagram, okay? So, well, they proved this is this. I mean, this was a very, very important invariant. I'm going to tell you some, some properties. Uh, we are start with the bad part, which is that if the link is alternating, then this Kovanov spectrum is not giving us more information than Kovanov homology. Okay, if the link is alternating, we don't get more information. But if the link is not alternating, then in some cases, we can get more information. In fact, this is a stronger invariant than Kovanov homology. For example, uh, these two knots of 11 crossings that you have here, they have the same Kovanov homology in all degrees. Their Kovanov homology tables are the same, but their Kovanov spectrums are not the same. Okay, so this is a stronger invariant. It's not a complete invariant because for example, these two knots are mutants and their, their Kovanov spectrum are, are the same, even if the knots are not equivalent. Uh, Kovanov spectrum- Can I ask a question? Yes. So it, the uh, Kovanov spectrum is topological space now or? What? The Kovanov spectrum is a topological space? 
Uh, yes, but, I mean, it's, it's a spectrum, but then you can take a geometric realization of it and you have like for each J, for each value of the quantum gradient, you can associate a topological space, let's say. Okay, okay thank you. Sorry, it's what an spectrum. It In order it to be invariant, you need to take the spectrum, meaning that the topological space for a fixed index J let's say it's invariant up to suspension. Okay. Sorry, okay. Uh, what? Oh. Every chi j is a spectrum or? What? If every chi j is a spectrum or they are the components of the spectrum. I'm thinking of sequence. Uh, the, oh, sorry, one. Uh, each j is a spectrum. I, yeah, I think, yes, yes, each J is an spectrum. What does it mean for the link to be alternating? I think before you define it for a diagram. For alternating? Yes. Uh, that the link can be, re uh, I mean, a diagram is alternating. If you can, if, when you follow the, let's say the picture of the diagram, you go, each time you have a crossing, you go over, under, over, under, oh, okay? Mm -hmm. This is an alternating diagram. So a link is alternating if, you, if it can be represented by an alternating diagram. If you can find an alternating diagram representing the link or the knot. Okay. Can I ask something else? Yes, yes. Um, by this wedge, what do you mean? The uh, coproduct on a spectra or? Well, here when I wrote that, I was speaking more about the once you take the topological space. So imagine is each x j is a topological space, okay? Because I'm speaking about the, the topological space. So take the wedge of whatever space you have here. If you have for j equals three, you have s four, and um, for x equal for j equals three, you have the projective plane. Then you have the wedge of the projective plane and s four and um, whatever you have. So every chi j then is a space, not yes. a spectrum. Yes. So it's sort of like a space made out of a spectrum. Yes. For each j, you have a spectrum, but from this spectrum, you can get the, uh, the realization as a space. So for each j at the end, you can think that you have a space, yes. But is it a, a specific construction that they made? Or yes, it yes. No, it is a specific construction, but uh, they even uh, do some, some computations and show how to to, yeah, it is a specific uh, construction. I can, if you want later, I can, I can give you the, the, the source in case you want to, to take a look on the, okay, thank on you. the paper and see the, the construction and the examples they compute. Sounds great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So well, this Kovanov spectrum behaves well under cobordism with this joint union with connected sums of links, and well, in general, is not a wedge sum of Moore spaces, meaning that yeah, we have interesting uh, topological spaces here. So now, uh, well, this was the Kovanov homology table. J was the quantum grading. I was the homological grading. So to the last row where we have some non-trivial Kovanov complex, okay? We are going to call the value of this J, J minimal, okay? J mean is the minimal value of J so that we have an a state here, a non-trivial complex here, okay? In Kovanov homology. And to the second from the top, uh, such a j, we call to this value of j, j almost minimal, j all mean, okay? Here we jump by two, so it is just j mean plus two. So 
and we can do the same from the top. We call this row J, the value of this JJ max, the value of this JJ almost maximal. And to this first and bottom uh, rows, we are going to call them extreme Kovanov complex or extreme Kovanov homology, if I refer to the Kovanov homology groups. And to the other ones, to the one times inner, uh, I mean, one inner place, I will call these rows almost extreme Kovanov uh, complex or almost extreme Kovanov homology. Okay, so extreme, the first and the lowest, and almost extreme, the second and the almost lowest. And well, I don't know if I can, should I continue or, uh, yeah, or I mean. Yeah, I mean, we started five minutes, minutes past. So I think at least okay. you have five minutes and also we are flexible. So if you want to go slightly over time, um, okay. that's also fine. So I will finish with this part of the geometrization. I will tell you now, uh, geometrization, just for this, for the extreme command of homology, for this lowest row and also for the upper row, but well, I'm going to explain it for the lowest row. So we have a diagram and we are going to associate this time to a diagram, a simplicial complex in such a way, this is something that uh, we, these are my Juan Gonzalez Meneses and Pedro Manchon are my supervisors and this was part of my PhD thesis. So uh, we proved that the cohomology complex of this simplicial complex is a copy of the extreme Kovanov complex of, uh, of the diagram we had, okay? So in particular, uh, extreme Kovanov homology of the diagram can be computed as the cohomology of this simplicial complex. So let's see how to construct this simplicial complex. We start with our diagram. Imagine we have this diagram, okay? And now we are going to ask, since we are interested in this lowest row, we are going to associate to each crossing a zero label, okay? A zero label. And we are smooth as we saw before, we are smooth uh, following a zero label. So in this concrete case, we get in this specific case, we get this picture, okay? The recall that the blue segments means the place where there was a crossing with a zero label. And well, if you think that, I mean, this is the same as this, okay? I'm just putting it nicer, the um, black, Curve is here like, like a circle. So these are the same. And now we are going, here we got one circle, but in other cases, you can get different circles, okay? As happens with the trefoil. So we say that a chord is admissible, a segment, I call segment chords. A chord is admissible if it has both endpoints in the same circle. So in this case, since we have just one circle, our chords are admissible. But if we have other circle here and chords connecting them, then this course will not be admissible, okay? So now we are going to construct a graph and we are going to draw a vertex for each admissible chord in this state. So in this case, we have six chords, all of them admissible. So I draw six vertices. And now I'm going to draw an edge connecting vertices I and J. If the endpoints of the corresponding chords alternate along the boundary of the circle. So here you need to have I, J, I, J. So then you draw an edge. Okay. So let's see our example one and two. You see, well, other way of thinking on that is. Imagine that you pull all the chords inside the circles. If they intersect, then you draw an edge. Okay, this is other way of thinking of that. But in this case, we have one and two, they, uh, they end points alternate, so we draw an edge. With two and three, we have the same, so we draw an edge. And if you do this with all the, the chords, we get this hexagon, okay? One and four, you have here one, one, for four, so they don't alternate. That is the reason why we don't draw anything between one and four, okay? So we have this graph. This is called the Lando graph. And then, uh, because, well, Lando used a similar construction to, to uh, he applied it to the construct, something related to Jones polynomial. 
So we preserve, of course, the name Lando graph. And now uh, we are going to construct a simplicial complex from this graph in the following way. The simplexes in this simplicial complex are going to be the independent subsets of vertices of the graph. What do I mean? The vertices, subsets of vertices that are not neighbors. So in this case, well, we always have the empty set. We have of dimension zero, how many vertices do we have? Uh, six, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, if we go one dimension higher, we say we have to take pairs of vertices that are independent, that are not connected. One and two are connected, so we cannot put them. One and three, yes, they are here. One and four, they are not connected, so they are here. One and five, then two and three not, but two and four, yes, they are not connected, so they are here and so on. Okay, these are the simplexes. If we go one dimension higher to the two dimensional simplexes, we say, okay, we need to pick three vertices that are not neighbors. So the only possibilities are one, three, five, and two, four, six. And that's it, because you cannot pick four vertices which are not connected. Okay, in this example, I mean, okay. So this is our simplicial complex. If we consider its geometric realization, we have something like that, one, three, five, and two, four, six. And this uh, one, these edges coming from those one dimensional simplexes, and that is what we get. So from the diagram, we have associated a simplicial complex, and we prove that the extreme Kovanov complex of the diagram is a copy of the cohomology complex of this guy that you have here. And in particular, the cohomology of this uh, simplicial complex gives us the extreme Kovanov homology of our diagram with some shiftings in the grading that depends on the orientation. We know the shifting, but I'm, I mean, uh, it doesn't make sense to explain it here. So yeah, this is the, the thing. This may simplify computations in case of connected sums or mutations. With this, we can generate H-thick links. Uh, well, H-thick links are just links whose non-trivial Kovanov homology uh, groups are not concentrated in a diagonal because usually non-trivial groups are in a diagonal of the table. So these are thin links, so H thick links, which are more rare that we have them, are those links having non-trivial groups far away from this diagonal. So with this method, we can generate those links. And well, we can apply techniques from uh, classical techniques for studying simplicial complexes to study the common homology of some diagrams. And in particular, well, there are some things that can be done to study this conjecture. And well, this was extreme common homology. You can do exactly the same from the top, exactly the same technique, just instead of using the zero smoothing, use the one smoothing. And instead of cohomology, use homology. So we get exactly the same result. And now if we want to go to the almost extreme row, then uh, if we restrict to a family of links that I'm not going to explain it, but they are called semi-adequate links. And it's, a, an, I mean, this family is big. It contains alternating links. Some alternative links are included here. So uh, we associate them, not a simplicial complex, but a presimplicial set. A presimplicial set is, roughly speaking, uh, you have a family of sets, okay, and some uh, some maps um, connecting them with some properties, satisfying some properties, some conditions. So, to each semi-adequate diagram, we associate a presimplicial set in a joint work with Joseph Shitisky. Uh, and we prove that the almost extreme command of complex of the diagram is a copy of the cellular chain complex of the geometric realization of those presimplicial sets. And you can say, well, well, in particular, as before, the almost extreme Kovanov homology of the diagram can be uh, read from the, um, from the homology of the, of, the of the geometric realization of the presimplicial set. So at this point, you can say, OK, very good. You associate an object, but do you know something about this object? Because, well, we don't know how difficult is this construction, OK? 
So the point is that we were able to determine the homotopy type of this, uh, this the geometric realization of this uh, presimplicial set. And uh, this one is either a wedge of spheres or a wedge of spheres with uh, the suspension of a projective plane. And we know this number, this C is the number of crossings of the diagram. And well, this from roughly speaking, you have the diagram, you construct an immediate graph and you check if the graph is bipartite, then you have this. If the graph is not bipartite, then you get this multiple type. And from here, you have a closed formula for the almost extreme Hovano homology of semi-adequate links, semi-adequate diagrams. Okay, so this is the, you have like the closed formula. Of course, you can do exactly the same from the almost extreme from the, the second from the top. Okay, the dual here. And uh, well, the next thing we could think is, okay, and what if we remove this condition of being semi-adequate? So this uh, we have uh, done this work with Federico Cantero Moran. Uh, we posted it in the archive recently at Christmas. So <laughs> yeah, this is a recent paper. Uh, but I tell you that the spaces you get are not very, I mean, you, in some cases you can determine which spaces you get, but in general it's not easy, okay? I mean, we, it's not just that it's not easy, we were not able to, to get the, like here, a closed formula for this homotopy type. So these are uh, more complicated spaces. And what is next? Okay, we would like to deepen in the, in the quantum degree going further, okay? And um, well, uh, there are many gaps in the understanding of Kovano homology. For example, uh, we don't know, we can compute it. Well, it's impractical, but we know how to compute it. But once you read the table for the examples that you can compute, you say, okay, what is torsion meaning? What, I mean, the information that Kovano homology is giving us about the link is not clear. There are many gaps still. So we think that maybe geometrization will bring some light into that. So yeah, that was the, all I wanted to tell you about this. 